update. Lee Day begins tomorrow. Campus will be buzzing with new faces and lots of activities for future and current students. Make sure to check out the Lee Day schedule on the Lee University website for a sneak peek of the fun. Let's make this the best Lee Day yet. Tomorrow is packed with opportunities to support Lee Athletics. The track and field team will host an invitational tournament tomorrow. The meet will last all day and will be held in the Raycon Sports Complex. The men's tennis team welcomes Auburn University Montgomery to town and will face off against them at 2 p.m. at the DeVos Tennis Center. To end the day, the baseball team will compete against West Alabama at 6 p.m. We wish all our teams good luck as they compete tomorrow. Till Day is Monday, April 8th, a day to support survivors of sexual assault as part of Awareness and Prevention Month. Volunteers will be at the Ped Mall from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., helping students learn more about this topic. Students can sign a prevention pledge and spin a prize wheel to get some goodies. There will be also a night of hope at the amphitheater from 7 to 8 p.m. This will be a time of reflection and worship honoring survivors. Cleveland Coffee will be provided. Ever tried racquetball? The racquetball club meets on Monday and Wednesday nights at 7.30 in the DeVos Rec Center. This is a great opportunity to get exercise throughout the week, regardless of the weather. For more information and to join the group me, visit Lee Racquetball Club on Instagram. Thanks for watching. Once again, I'm Kenzie Sprouse. And I'm Alex Wright, and you've just been updated.
desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the sacrifice that you made for us and God we thank you that this hope that we're is not it's not dead it's alive because he is risen 
we love you, Jesus, and we thank you for all that you've done for us, and we thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Thank you, Lee, you worship. And not to sound too churchy, but are you grateful for the resurrection of Jesus Christ? The living hope that that does provide us every single day. And that's what's going to be discussed here in chapel this morning. But before I introduce our speaker, let me remind you once again of Summer Sizzle happening today from 1130 to 4 in the dining hall. You have some interest in uh, summer school. Uh, we want you to come by there between 1134. There'll be faculty there. There'll be advising. We have financial aid people there. We'll have financial services folks there just to talk to you about the opportunities of summer school. We also have some summer job opportunities you can hear about as well as discount ho housing if this something you want to do on campus. But go by there. Summer school is a great way to kind of get ahead as well as to catch up. Um, but if you're interested in that, please stop by there between 1130 and 4. Uh, you'll find out a lot of information about summer school as well as the opportunity to register. So pleased to have our speaker this morning who's going to continue in the series we began Tuesday called The Meaning. We talked about the meaning of the cross. Today we're going to talk about the meaning of the resurrection. Next Tuesday we'll talk about the meaning of the ascension where Jesus Christ ascends back to heaven. There's a uh, significance to, to that. So you want to be here for that. Dr. Terry Cross, our dean of the School of Theology and Ministry, will bring that to us on Tuesday of next week. Today, we're happy to have with us Dr. Kevin Nordby. He, uh, yeah, absolutely. He started working here at Lee in 2022. He is the assistant professor of religion, culture, and philosophy. And uh, he's doing a great work. He's also a chairperson in the School of Theology and Ministry. He and his wife, Stephanie, have one son named Aviel. Do I have that right? Very good. Hey, put your hands together. Let's welcome Dr. Kevin Norb as he comes to share today. Well, hey, gang. Thank you for uh, the applause. I appreciate it. Hey, look, this is a good start. I buttoned my coat when I came up, and I buttoned it unevenly. So... My uh, professional training is in being a professional nerd. Professional nerds are not always great public speakers. We'll see how it goes. But it's my privilege to be here today and speak to you. I have to give you two warnings. One is I have a cold. So those of you who know me will wonder why my voice is so robust and deep right now. Um, God blessed me with that advantage. And the other is to say I'm strangely nervous. And it occurs to me this is probably the only time as a professor I shouldn't be nervous at all because there's this thing that haunts the dreams of professors at Lee. And that thing is called a student course evaluation. <laughs> and there is no student course evaluation for chapel. So really, I can do anything and it's fine. Um, of course, I know that there will be a student course evaluation on Yik Yak, but that doesn't affect my job security. <laughs> so I'm not worried about that. Anyways, so I'm going to talk to you about apologetics and the resurrection, both of these. To do that, I first want to say, what is apologetics? What the heck is that thing? Is it about apologizing? No, it is not sorryology or uh, regretogetics. Whether it sounds like it or not, I wish I could rename it, but whether it sounds like it or not, it is about giving a reason for the hope that is within you being able to do that. More specifically, it's about helping others to see the intellectual, moral, relational, imaginative beauty of Christianity. Yes, yes, the intellectual beauty, but more than that, also the relational, ethical, imaginative beauty. It's about removing obstacles that stop people from seeing and noticing and being able to see that beauty so they can take it in. All right, so that's apologetics. That's what I do, other than philosophy. And what about the resurrection? How am I gonna deal with that topic as well? Well, I think there are two primary obstacles that people face when it comes to the resurrection. And as an apologist, I wanna remove these obstacles, if at all possible. The first obstacle is intellectual. It's the intellectual solidity of the resurrection. How do we know it really happened? It was a very long time ago. The second obstacle is about the relational beauty of the resurrection. 
So let's get on to dealing with them. Well, the first obstacle, this intellectual obstacle, I'm actually not going to spend as much time dealing with it, which might surprise you because it's what apologists usually talk more about. But that's precisely why I'm not going to. All of you have access to a great many excellent books and podcasts and so on that do that piece of the work. You don't really need me to do it for you. I can, but I'm not sure that would be as helpful. You can go on and read Gary Habermas or Richard Bauckham or whoever you like, and you should. And you should probably ask the dean who will speak in the next chapel if Kevin can lead a reading group on campus through one of those books. It would be fun. Uh, so we should do that. But the second, the obstacle of missing the relational beauty of the resurrection, I think is less often dealt with. So I want to deal with that primarily. But I'll gesture at some answers to the first one, if nothing else, to bait you to come to my office hours to talk about them more. And I hope you do. So there are really three questions. Did he really exist? Did he really die? Did he come back? Uh, why should we believe those? Why shouldn't we believe those? Well, it's historically uncontroversial that he existed. It's historically uncontroversial that he died. There are people who would advance swoon theories and such, but no one really takes these very seriously unless they have some kind of ax to grind. So the question is, how do we know he came back? Well, dealing with history is different than dealing with other things. History isn't like biology where you can recreate the conditions by following a procedure in a laboratory and get the same results. History already happened. We can't do that. Some people say because of this, it didn't happen. But that doesn't quite follow. I mean, we can't go back and talk to George Washington, but we won't say he didn't exist or live or do anything because of that. History is still real. Even though you might not know anything about your great, 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 great grandparents, they surely existed, otherwise you wouldn't be here. History is real, even though it was a long time ago. So operating within that framework, what might we say? What might we look at? Well, we might look and see what kind of eyewitness accounts were there. Well, the first eyewitness account was the letters of Paul, just 15 to 20 years or so after the resurrection. Why are Paul's letters interesting? Well, Paul attests to the resurrection in his letters, in the first case. On the third day, that little detail there helps us see that he is talking about a historical event, not a metaphorical event or something like that. And what's really interesting is he mentions people in his letters. Mentions people by name and then mentions a great many witnesses. Why that is interesting is because these folks were still around and kicking when he wrote those letters. And those letters were public documents intended to be read aloud at a church. So let's say that, I don't know, two weeks from now, I say to my classes, y'all remember that chapel when I brought in a free puppy for everyone? No, I'm not doing that. Don't look under your seat for a puppy. Um, you, my students would probably say, we were there, that didn't happen. On the other hand, if I was teaching and I said this and all of my students were like, well, yeah, maybe it happened. Uh, he wrote these letters, these open letters, naming names so you could go and basically imply. It's like if I said, remember that chapel when I gave everyone a free puppy? Ethan was there. Go, you know, I'm volunteering corroboration. If these people were dead, that would be different. Everyone was silent. No one said, hey, that's not how it went down. There are lots of other details. I said I wouldn't spend that much time on this. I'll give one or two others. Uh, one, the first eyewitnesses were female. Uh, I think that's awesome. But in the culture at the time, it was not seen as awesome. Women were treated poorly, very, very poorly, poorly enough that their testimony wasn't even admissible in court. So if I was going to make up something, why on earth would I make the first witnesses people who were not seen as admissible? Missable in giving evidence. That seems like a bad strategy. It also seems peculiar that I would say someone came back and was resurrected in the flesh. So you might know in the Greco-Roman world of the day, resurrection was something that was in people's imagination, but not resurrection in the body. The meaningful thing about resurrection in the Greco-Roman world would have been liberating yourself from your body. But the body's a problem 
and you get to be alive and free from it. So saying, look, he came back in the flesh, a Greco-Roman audience would be like, well, that's he's kind of a loser. <laughs> the um, Jewish community of the day, they did believe in a resurrection and they did believe in a bodily resurrection. But they believed in a bodily resurrection that was going to happen much, much later and for everyone. And in fact, for all of creation. So if you said, hey, we're gonna win those people over, hey, I'm gonna go to them and say, hey, one person was resurrected. They're gonna be like, what? what? One person? Is there still disease? Is all that other stuff still happening? What are you talking about? That's not how this works. So this wouldn't have even have been in the imaginations of the apostles or Paul or others to fabricate this. This would have been unexpected. Okay, hopefully that's enough to whet your appetite. I'm gonna move on from that side because again, other people can do that for you. And I'd like to show you those people sometime. But I think what people miss is the second obstacle. The second obstacle is where the action is, I think, for me, for you today. So the second obstacle, the relational obstacle, what is that? I think it's something that stops non-Christians and Christians, it stops us alike from seeing and understanding the beauty of Christianity and the resurrection. What is it? What is this thing that is holding us back? The thing that is holding us back is our pitiful idea, our pitiful idea of love. We don't really believe that God loves us. We don't really understand that he loves us. It's hard enough to really believe your boyfriend or girlfriend loves you or your parents or your dog, maybe easier with your dog. Uh, it's hard to believe deep in your bones that God loves you, not just everyone, but you. That's an obstacle. That if we remove it, we notice the relational beauty of Christianity through the resurrection. So I want to try to remove it. After the cross, Jesus died. This is uncontroversial, but he came back to life. What brought him back? What was it that brought him back? Was it because he is infinitely powerful? No. Was it because he is infinitely knowing? No. Sure, he's omniscient, he's omnipotent, but he could have done anything with those abilities. What brought him back? What made him choose that? What motivates his use of those to come back to us? His love, there's that cold. His love, his love for you brought him out of the grave. That might sound sacrilegious, it's making you so important. Uh, beware, anything that seems like that couldn't be true of Jesus because it makes you too important, probably is barking up the wrong tree. Okay, his love for you took him out of the grave. Scripture tells us that he is beyond power. Scripture tells us that he is beyond knowledge, but scripture tells us that he is love. He's not identified with power, he's not identified with knowledge, but he's identified with love. So take, say, uh, and I'll include references in case anyone doesn't trust me because I don't have the snazzy things that Dr. Moore had. That's my fault, not their fault. 1 John 4, 8. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Not because God has love or has all power, because God is love. 1 John 4, 16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And I'm not helping myself to the New Living Translation or the message or even the Amplified here. I'm using translations that are less likely to say exactly what I want them to so you know I'm not cheating. God is not identified with knowledge or power. It's obvious he has these fully. Uh, trying to argue that point would be as trivial as arguing that it's cold in Minnesota in the winter. But his love for you is what animates these abilities. We don't know God's love that way. Why not? We know he's there, but we don't typically open ourselves up to him in this way. In fact, sometimes I think we even resent that he is there, that we can't actually push him away. In other words, 
radical vulnerability is horribly uncomfortable. Most of us don't want it. And it takes a good deal of courage to choose radical vulnerability. The more we understand how much God loves us, the more vulnerable we are to him. And that makes you itch. Perhaps, perhaps we don't believe it because if God really loves me that way, loves me ferociously, if that's really how he loves me, well, I still choose to sin. I can't face that I am hurting a God that loves me that much sometimes. Maybe you can't. So instead of having the courage to face that or to change my behavior, instead, I choose to believe that sure his love is out there, but it's not really love. It's somehow not really real, not really present, not really overwhelming. And so it's not so bad that I mistreat God by hurting him. Which is worse, acknowledging that I've hurt someone who loves me deeply, or saying to someone who loves me deeply, well, you don't really love me that much anyway, so I hurt you, but it's not that big of a deal. I'm not sure the second is better. Why do we do this? Why don't we let ourselves believe this love? Well, it's frightening. What would it be to be loved that way, that fully, that overwhelmingly, and truly accept it deep in your bones? One worship artist that I enjoy puts it this way. He is jealous for me, loves, his love's like a hurricane, and I am the tree, bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. I like the image of a tree bent over in a hurricane. The love is so powerful, it can almost destroy you. When all of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are. In other words, if you're not willing to be the tree bent over in the hurricane, you'll never see how beautiful God is and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us all. Don't be too afraid to walk into the hurricane. But isn't it selfish to focus this much on ourselves? Isn't it selfish to think of ourselves as loved this way? I mean, God surely wouldn't do that. Doesn't that make us all too important? Well, how important are we to God? Well, we're important enough to die for, and we're important enough to conquer death for. Okay, so you all should know this because the next verse you definitely know. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It does not say, but God was so powerful that he gave his one and only son. God was so grand that he gave his, God was so omniscient that he gave his one and only. God was so full of glory that he gave his one and only. It says one thing, God so loved the world. That means you are the thing that motivated him. Exodus 19 tells us that God says this, even though, this is, this is hard to get my head around, even though the whole earth is mine, everything, you will be, you are my treasured possession. That is the way God speaks about us, that you are more important to God than anything on earth. If you think I'm saying something that's too strong, then you don't take the Bible seriously. It's hard to realize taking the Bible seriously almost feels selfish. We can also see this in what is called the greatest commandment. This is the Shema prayer. It's all throughout the Bible, uh, both Testaments, but I like the version from Matthew 22. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, before going on, this is a big deal. <laughs> we don't pay enough attention to this. Um, no offense if any of you are, have done this, but I, ha I hear a lot of talks where people say, how are we gonna know what matters to God? Well, let's look at the words he said, and which one did he say the most often? Or maybe the same with Paul, Paul or someone else. If you counted the word I say the most often, it would probably be and, or maybe the. Um, that's silly. On the other hand, we have a moment where Jesus is asked, what is most important? Well, perhaps I should just take him at his word and not play detective. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. 
This is the first and greatest commandment. It's creepy to let that sink in. What that means is, what's the most important thing that you can do for God today? It has nothing to do with anyone else but you and God. You might raise a ton of money today for something important. You might share the gospel with a lot of people today. But if you haven't first loved God, those things are meaningless. That, it makes me feel creepily vulnerable to him. We need to change that. He goes on to say, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The second, not the first. Yeah, do it. But if you're not doing it out of the understanding that you are dearly, dearly prized and loved, then you're doing it wrong. It's so easy to say, well, I'll just do that and I'll know God's okay with me because I'm doing the right things. That's exactly the opposite. That makes God sad. As if we wouldn't believe him, Jesus follows up. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. He didn't need to say that. He already said this one's the first and this one's the second. But it's, I think he suspects we won't believe him. So he's like, by the way, these are the most important. I'm gonna repeat myself. So what does Jesus want most from you? Is it your behavior? He does want that. Is that what he wants most? No, it's not what he wants most. Not if we take scripture seriously. If we take scripture seriously, what he wants most from you is your heart and just that. And without that, none of the rest of it means anything to him. Without love, you are nothing can also be translated. Without love, you are a useless nobody. Love is very, very important. I'll come back to this later, but love isn't just doing things. My wife is here in the front row, and I'm happy she's here. She's doing that because she loves me. But that isn't the same as loving me. We all know people who have marriages who do the things that one should do when they love each other, but don't actually love each other. Loving someone is not the same as simply doing the things. So you might want to say that loving God is just obeying him, but that is wrong, according to scripture. Scripture tells us this, if we love him, we will obey him. Now, for most of my life, I thought, great, loving him is super important. If we love him, we'll obey him, so if I obey him, I'm good. Nope, that's a mistake. Put on my philosophy professor hat. That's called a conditional, an if-then statement. It's like saying this, if you study, you will pass my test. Does that mean if you passed my test, you studied? Nah, you could pass it out of dumb luck or something else. They are two separate events. If you study, you will pass my test. It means if you do this thing, this other thing will take place, but it is still its own thing. If you love me, then you will obey me. So obeying him, no, that's separate than loving him. If you love him, you're gonna do it. But if you obey him alone, it is meaningless. He wants your heart more than he wants your behavior, overwhelmingly so. We can also see this in John 17. This one comes from my wife, and I love it. She pointed it out, Dr. Stephanie Nordby. In John 17, we catch a glimpse of Jesus praying to the Father. We get to eavesdrop, so to speak, on when Jesus is praying to God the Father. What does he say? What does he talk about? He says a number of things, but one of them is this. He tells the Father, I want them to be with me where I am. So when no one is looking, what does Jesus ask God the Father? Hey, can you make sure that I get to stay with them? Can you make sure that they get to stay with me? That's what I'm after here. Not, can you make sure that they are perfect and that they do all the right things? Can you make sure that they get to be with me and that I get to be with them? He says how much he wants us to be together. The resurrection doesn't happen out of duty. The resurrection, it's not the case that Jesus says, well, I've got to clean up this mess they made. No, he says, I can't bear for them to be separate from me. I want them to be with me where I am. Well, you might then ask, if God is so loving, why did anyone have to die in the first place? Couldn't that have just been avoided? But this reminds me of a story, a story some of you have heard in my classes. 
about a ranch, uh, it's a ministry for abused horses and abused children. And I'm gonna read a couple of excerpts for an illustration and then unpack it. Why must anyone die? Adam was so small for his age. It was the first thing I noticed when his caseworker introduced us. His eyes, shadowed with sadness, were too large for his little face. He was drawn into himself as if he were trying to fit his diminutive frame into an even smaller space. It was clear that this child had known more terror in his handful of years than most knew in a lifetime. I smiled at him and he immediately looked at the ground in retreat. My heart staggered under the weight of his loneliness. I asked him if he had ever ridden a horse before and he stared at the ground and silently and slowly shook his head. Would you like to? I asked. His little head snapped right up and he looked at me directly in the eyes this time with more than just a little disbelief. I smiled into his questioning face. Well, we have a pony for you, I told him, a very special pony who'd really like to meet you. Really? He asked with more emotion than I think he had shown in a while. I pointed back behind the arena to where the golden pony was, Hobbs. Adam flashed a little grin and took off at a run for the pony. From a distance in that moment, he must have looked like every other child at the ranch. But from my view, I was horrified. His grin revealed a mouth that was full of broken teeth. But he ran on ahead of us. I turned to his counselor and quietly asked, is that what I think it is? It took her a long moment to answer. And when she did, her voice was choked by the grip of anger and compa compassion together. It's so much worse than you could imagine, she finally stated. A father is supposed to love, cherish, and protect his son, not only as Adam's dad, broken most of his teeth with his fists. Before he went to prison, he would get drunk and make his little boy run around the yard while he shot at his feet with a rifle. We walked on in silence. Both of us watched Adam enter the pony's paddock and begin to stroke the pony's face. It's a miracle he's still alive, she finally said. There's a happy ending there. Come to my office hours, recurring theme, I'll tell you the happy ending. Why did I bring that up? That is a true story. I brought it up to help us understand God's love. Why must anyone die? Well, because God loves little Adam too much for that. God loves little Adam too much to allow the tragedy, the injustice to go unanswered and ignored. Who should have to pay for this? The abusive father, of course, but still God does not do that for God loves Adam's father too. But he must have justice for little Adam he cannot do it at the, and will not do it at the expense of the Father. So what will he do? He will lay himself down, sacrificing himself for little Adam's justice. This is what God's love looks like, and it's why someone has to answer for the world's wrongs. That is the loving response. One of the things that I've learned from my little boy that Stephanie and I have noticed is what it means to love the violent father as well. We've noticed that now when we see people doing bad things in bad situations, it's hard to see a drug addict or a prostitute or a liar anymore. Instead, we see someone who once was a little child, who once was like little Adam. What's interesting about God is God never stops seeing, never stops seeing anyone that way. He sees everyone this way and he always will. And I'm starting to see that afresh now. Jesus tells us in Matthew 18 that the only way we can enter the kingdom of heaven is if we come as little children. Well, what, what does this look like? Well, I think, as I said, God is teaching me about this through my son. So I want to show you a photo of Avi and me. Okay, there it is. So that's Avi. Yeah, he's the cutest baby that ever babied. And you might notice my clothing and think, why would Kevin wear oily pants? <laughs> and like a workshop shirt and a headlamp to play with his son? Those would be very good questions. Well, you see, what was happening on that day is it was one of those snow days we had. You're all making snowmen, having snowball fights and sleeping in, and I should have been too. But my car was broken and it needed the half shaft repaired, so I was spending that time working in the cold in the garage. But something changed. Avi woke up from his nap, and he saw snow for the first time. 
and he was enchanted. Now I had important work to do. Did I keep doing it? Of course not. Do you know what matters less to me than loving my son and watching him understand my love? Everything, everything matters less to me than that. So my love for him brought me out from under that car. Sure, I was strong enough to get out from under it. Sure, I knew how to get out from under it. But what actually brought me out from under it? My love for him. The important things I had to do, yeah, I needed to do them. But what did I care more about? The joy of loving my son and seeing him know my love. I wanted him to be where I was. Do you know that God loves you in exactly the same way? But with so, so much more intensity. It's frightening to accept that. Our works, our performance, our status in the world cannot be our identity because sooner or later they will all fail, probably sooner than later, but God's love never fails. One author I enjoy put it this way. You see, no matter what, in spite of everything, God would love his children with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And though they would forget him and run from him, deep in their hearts, God's children would always miss him and long for him. Lost children yearning for their home. I'll leave you with lyrics from a worship song that makes this point. God's love is radical. He's redeeming you and into redeeming the whole world too for love. Everything, everything that I thought I knew, everything, everything sad is coming untrue. Life is coming alive. Death is destined to die. But love, when we learn to live again and let forgiveness win, there's no wound that love won't mend and then finally redeem. The son of God woke in the ground. The angel laid the soldiers down to bring the king his crown. I believe everything, everything I thought I knew, everything sad, is coming untrue. The resurrection means everything sad is coming untrue. We say that, but I don't know how often you feel it in your bones. You've got to step out into the hurricane and let God love you. Um, I'm out of time. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Norm. But you know, we often talk about the love of God and Christ connected to the cross. But I don't know how often we talk about the love of God and Christ connected to the resurrection. Thank you for kind of putting those two together for us, Dr. Norman. I encourage you, go by his office. He loves to meet with students and have conversations more about the meaning of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and other things as well. Um, let me also just quickly point out to you coming up this weekend is Lee Day. And we're going to have, yeah. Yeah. We're going to have hundreds of students and prospective, prospective students and families on campus. But Lee Day isn't just for them, it's for you as well. So we hope you'll uh, join us for some of the events. Let me just point out a few of those on Friday, tomorrow evening, 5.30, block party up on the Ped Mall. A lot of fun, a lot of music be happening there. Shenanigans, 7 p.m. tomorrow night. Yep. Pango Hall. We got some music ensemble performances taking well as uh, taking place as well. Then also tomorrow evening, 8:30, Midnight Cafe. You want to be a part of that. Saturday morning, we got stuff going on. Spotlight right here in the Con Center. Just talking about a lot of the Lee things that are happening. Worship rally Saturday afternoon at four o'clock, and then a cookout in Alumni Park following that. So all those are available. You come be a part of Lee Day. You're as much a part of that as these prospective students are as well. Let's stand together, please. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, I pray that the reality of your son's resurrection as mysterious and unfathomable and incomprehensible as it is, would never be lost on us. I pray for those of us that have grown up in church and grown up in Christian homes that we've heard about the resurrection so often that it would just become some commonplace thing. I ask that through these words of Dr. Nordby and by your spirit, for all of us, you would reignite um, the beauty, the, the wonder, the greatness, the joy, the gratitude for your resurrection. 
because you do love us so much that you came back to life. He died for us. We didn't deserve it. He resurrected for us, and we didn't deserve it, but you did it so that we truly might have life. And I pray for the student in this room that doesn't understand how great your love is and what you've done. And I pray for the one who perhaps once walked with you but doesn't now for whatever reason. I pray that they once again see how much you care and how much you're calling them back into relationship with you. We love you, God. Help us to understand the fullness of your love for us. And thank you for the words that were shared today. And God, now we pray together. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. God bless everybody. Freebie for chapel again. I know you hate that, but hang in there with us. We'll get it together. Have a great rest of your day. Hey, don't forget Summer Sizzle starting right now in the dining hall.